Let's turn over to the book of Isaiah chapter 40. I started sharing last night about how to fulfill God's will. And last night I talked about the importance of obedience. In a way, I hate to even tell you what the subject was because if you weren't here, you might have gone and gotten it. But once I tell you it's about obedience, people think, oh, I know everything about that. I don't want to hear about obedience. But if you're going to fulfill God's will, you've got to learn how to obey and follow the instructions that God gives you. It does no good. If you are just a hearer only and not a doer of the word, you deceive your own self. And there's a lot of self-deception today because any time you have something in your heart that you don't follow through on, it brings confusion and a layer of deception. You've got to be quick to do. Paul said when he stood before Agrippa, he says, I exercise myself always to have a conscience void of offense. Boy, now that's a major statement. He says, I never violate my conscience. Man, there's not very many people who can say that. But every time you violate your conscience, it's like a, um, what do you call those? A blister or a callus on your hand. You don't get a callus instantly. It comes just one layer over another layer over another layer. You become calloused, insensitive to God. Every time God leads you to do something and you don't obey, it just decreases your sensitivity one layer. And you do it over and over and over again. And eventually people get to the point that they say, I just can't hear the voice of God. And yet God is speaking constantly. He says, my sheep do hear my voice. And God speaks to you constantly. He is always telling you and giving you instructions. But you have to be sensitive to it. And every time we violate our conscience and go contrary to it, you become a little bit more calloused. You know, some of you, if you could remember when you were just growing up, maybe some of you were taught not to drink, not to smoke, not to dip or cuss or chew or go with those that do. And you were taught what was right. But then you started exerting yourself And the first time you ever drank, the first time you ever smoked, the first time you ever cussed, I guarantee you it bothered you. But you know what? You do it and you get a little bit insensitive and then you do it again and over a period of time you can get to the place like you can cuss like a sailor and not even think about what you're saying. You get to where you do these things. But when you started, there was a sensitivity, but you just deaden yourself to it step by step by step. It's important that you obey God and not do that in the spiritual realm, that you obey God. And then what I want to talk about today is about patience. And I'm going to say some things. When patience is another dirty word to a lot of people, especially to Americans. We want, we want what we want right now. And then you've got all of these things that are out there to indulge your flesh, telling you why should you have to wait for a house? Let's go ahead and buy right now. We'll give it to you for zero down and we'll give you an adjustable rate mortgaged where you don't even pay anything for the first six months. And you know what? There's people that go for stuff like that not even realizing that there's a train wreck down the road. You are, nobody's going to give you something for free. You are eventually going to pay for this and if you don't pay now, you're going to pay later with interest. And yet most people will just go for this. They will go for these things in the mail that says 0% interest on a credit card. And people sign up for that stuff, not realizing that you get six months 0% interest and then they're going to sock it to you and double your rate and make you pay more than somebody else pays six months down the road. And yet most people are so short-term in their thinking, they just go for the immediate fix rather than buying a used car that would meet your needs and saving up and eventually getting to where you can buy a new car debt-free, they will go out and buy a fancy car and pay two and a half times what the cost is worth by the time they pay five or six years' worth of interest. And the average person goes for that. It's quiet in here. You know, I'm not going to ask you to respond, but if I asked you to respond, the majority of people sitting in this room are hocked up to your ears. And I'm not saying that all debt is totally wrong. 
There, you know, you can buy some things, and as long as you're gaining an asset, that's different. But I'm saying that most people in here have overextended yourself because credit is so easy. They play on your flesh. And you know what it amounts to? You aren't patient. And what you're doing is paying so much money for things. By the time you get a car paid off over five years, did you know that the vast majority of cars will not last five years in good shape? And so what you're going to do is probably trade in four years and be upside down on this deal and get into another deal that's going to be bad debt plus the old bad debt from the first car. And you do that two or three times. And before you know it, you're getting foreclosed on. That's not the way that it works. You can't do things like that. But it's just plain, and it's because we don't have patience. Patience is something that Americans don't have a lot of. We are offered all this free credit. Get it now for free. Why wait? Do it now. And I, I tell you, even in the spiritual realm, very few people have patience. It's not a human quality. Look at this verse here in Isaiah chapter 40. And in verse, um, verse 28, it says, Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary? There is no searching of his understanding. You know, I can spend a lot of time on this, but just think about this. What he's saying is that God doesn't get weary. God doesn't faint. God never gives up. It's a God quality. It is not a human quality. People quit. People give up. People fail. People can't wait. It is not human nature to wait. We want what we want, and we want it right now. That's human. But God, He doesn't faint. He doesn't get weary. In verse uh, 29, it says, He giveth power to the faint. God is the one that gives this power, this patience, this endurance. And to them that have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young man shall utterly fail. In other words, it doesn't matter. The strongest, the best, the most fit of all people are going to fail. Human nature fails. We in ourselves are not sufficient. It's only a God quality that he gives you patience and endurance. But in verse 31 it says, But they that wait... Upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. This waiting on the Lord is talking about patience. And it's not waiting like you wait for a bus. Like you're just sitting there and, man, when is this thing coming? That's what a lot of people think waiting on the Lord is. Well, I'm just waiting on the Lord. I've prayed, and it's just up to God. Que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. That is not waiting on the Lord. This is talking about waiting like a waiter, a good waiter, waits on a customer. He is sitting there watching and waiting. Is your glass empty? Do you need some more water? Is there anything else I can help you with? Have you done this? You are looking. You are paying attention. You are serving. This isn't talking about that you're just sitting there watching the television and waiting on God to come through. That's not waiting. That's just carnal. It's not spiritual. This is talking about patience. It's using a different word, but it's talking about patience, and it only comes from God. God's the only one who doesn't faint. God's the only one who has perfect endurance. God's the only one who always stays on target and on focus. And if you are going to continue on and fulfill what God has called you to do, you are going to have to go to God and have him work this patience on the inside of you and give you the ability to endure because it is not human nature. We hate waiting. You know, I teach on this in our Bible school, and I get a lot of responses. And I've had some people get very upset and say that no way am I waiting. I'm not going to wait. God is going to do things for me instantly. And I've had people quit school because they were just so adamant. i got to do something right now. And, you know, that's been years and years and years ago, and they hadn't done it yet. They would have been better off just to be patient and let God work in their life and do things. 
that people just are constantly getting out there and trying to run ahead and they want everything. Even if you find God's will and even if you start following God's will, the tendency is that most people can't last over a prolonged period of time. I don't know if you've understood this or not. But I've seen this. I've seen it with ministers. I've seen it with a lot of people. Matter of fact, there's a statistic. I'm not going to quote the source because I'm not actually sure. I got it secondhand through another person. But I heard that there are 80% of people who go into the ministry fail within five years or get out of the ministry within five years. And out of the 20% who are still in ministry after five years, 80% of those are ready to quit. If that's an accurate statistic, that means only 4%, 20% of the 20%, 4% out of all of the people who go into ministry are still enjoying it and successful and productive after five years. And you know what? From my experience, that's about right. I have seen hundreds of people come and go that were so excited and had a zeal for God, and yet they just can't maintain it. It's not a dash, it's a marathon. And most people, they, there are some people that start the race real good and pull out ahead of people, but they don't have any endurance. And they only stand for a short while and they give up. And I tell you, this is a major problem. So how is it that you get this patience? You know, let me first of all say it, how, how it isn't that you get it. Because there's been a lot of misteaching. I believe about this. And people will take scriptures like James chapter 1 where it says, uh, but let, have, let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. And then they'll combine that with Romans chapter 5 that talks about tribulation worketh patience and patience experience and experience hope and hope makes not a shame. And they, there's a lot of people that teach that tribulation, hardship is what gives you patience. That is not true. That is not what the Word of God says. It says tribulation will work patience. It will exercise it. It will give you an opportunity to grow. But patience comes from the Scripture. Look at this verse over in Romans chapter 15. In Romans chapter 15 in verse 4. It says, Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. The Scripture is where patience comes from. Let me, you know, I'm gonna, I've got a lot to say. I've been praying about this, and there's so much to say about how to fulfill God's will that I'm going to cram a bunch of teaching into one session this morning. So you need to listen fast, and you need to get the CDs and stuff. I'm not going to spend time to verify all of this, but I could show you that patience, in my explanation, is nothing but faith over a prolonged period of time. Some people can have a momentary faith. You can get a person psyched up into faith. You can build their faith. You can encourage them, and people can kind of get into faith momentarily. But patience is just a faith that isn't, doesn't waver. It stays consistent over a prolonged period of time. It's an enduring type of faith. Patience is faith. It's just a long-term faith. And there's a lot of people that can get started and they feel faith for a period of time, but they can't maintain it. And it's because it comes from the Scripture. If patience came from tribulation, then those of you who've been tribulated the most would be the most patient. That is not true. You can look around and some of the people that have the most problems are the most impatient. Patience doesn't come from problems. Patience comes from the Scripture. Actually, patience is a fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5.22. It says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, faith, meekness, temperance. If you look that up in any of the other translations, it'll put patience in there. Patience is a fruit of the Spirit. When you get born again, God gives you patience. As you study the Word, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. And patience is nothing but faith over a prolonged period of time. 
It comes from the Word. And when you get put in a pressure situation and tribulations come against you, it gives you an opportunity to grow and develop in your faith. But faith has to already be there through the Word and through what God has put in your heart. If you are embracing problems, it's not going to help you. You have to resist them. And, and this teaching that God put problems in your life to make you patient is incorrect. Satan puts problems in your life to steal away the Word. But if you stand on the Word and, and keep doing what God told you to do, you're going to be stronger in faith, stronger in patience. Your patience, your faith will work over a prolonged period of time and it'll produce. And so patience is important, but it doesn't come through your hardships. It comes through the Word of God. Look in Hebrews chapter 6. This is an important passage of Scripture. All of them are important. But this is important to patience. In Hebrews chapter 6, verse 11, And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Boy, I could spend a lot of time on this. I'm just going to hit this quickly. But it says, don't be slothful. You know what that means? Lazy. But in contrast to being slothful, be followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Did you know faith and patience takes effort? It takes a lot of effort. You have to seek God. You have to turn off other things that draw your attention away and numb you and deaden you to God. And it takes commitment. This is one of the reasons that coming to Bible school is so important for a lot of people because it is a commitment. It is a major commitment. And it costs you something. It costs you a lot of time. It costs you money. It costs you effort. And people, when they start putting effort into something, they get more out of it. And there are a lot of people that their life is just made up of getting up, going to work, coming home, watching television, going to bed, and then doing the whole thing all over again. And they're just on a, they're like a little hamster on a wheel, just going round and around and around and doing all this stuff and getting nowhere. There's a lot of people that are slothful. They aren't seeking God. They don't know the Word of God. And you've just got to make a commitment to seek God. It takes effort to walk in faith and patience, but that's how you inherit the promises of God. If you want to fulfill God's will, you've got to stay constant over a period of time. It can't go in spurts. You can't just seek the Lord when your back is against the wall and you've got a trouble standing, staring you in the face, and so you seek God until you get help over that thing, and then as soon as the pressure's off, you go back to being carnal. And go back to all of the things that produced the problems that you had in the first place. Quiet in here. I'm describing, brothers and sisters, what's happening in most people's lives. You go in spurts. And you know the root of it? It's just lazy. Just slothful. You know what? It takes less effort to be fat than it does to be skinny. It's easier to get sick than it is to stay well. It's easier to float downstream than it is to swim upstream. A dead fish can float downstream. <laughs> it's easier to be sick than it is to be well. I've had so many people just during this meeting tell me all their problems and just, I mean, multiple things. Some people have 15 or 20 things wrong and my thought is, why did you let this happen? And most people, I don't have any control over this. That is absolutely wrong. You resist the devil and he'll flee from you. You need to recognize it. Man, you need to fight these things. Arthritis doesn't come on you like a seizure. You just don't wake up and boom, you're hit with arthritis. It comes a little joint at a time and you accept it here because you can live with it. And then you accept it there and you're just too busy watching as the stomach turns on the television. And you let it in bit by bit. And before you know it, here you are and your whole body's racked with pain because you accepted it little by little by little. It takes diligence. It takes effort for you to have faith and patience and resist and to stay in the Word of God. And in a sense, I'm preaching to the choir because this is Friday morning. And you're out here listening to me. You know what? You're the fanatics. You're the ones that are putting some effort into it. 
And so I commend you, but at the same time, we need to continue. It says, we through faith and patience inherit the promise. For when God made promise unto Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself, saying, surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. It took time. And notice that that patience was based on a promise. God spoke to him the word of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Patience is nothing but faith over a prolonged period of time. He had a promise that he anchored his faith to, and after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. It says in Genesis chapter 12 that Abraham was 75 years old when he left Haran and came into the land of Canaan. 75 years old. He was 100 years old when Isaac was born. So that's 25 years from the time God told him, I'm going to make your seed as the stars in the sky and as the grains of sand on the seashore. 25 years. 25 years. There's a lot of people that if we pray for them and if their pain is gone by the time they hit the floor, well, then they're in faith. But if it takes longer than three seconds, longer than five seconds, if they don't see instant manifestation and there's people that I just don't know why God didn't do anything, that's not patience. You're going to have to learn that it takes time. And especially outside of healing and things like this, when you are trying to find God's will for your life and fulfill God's will, it takes time. Mark chapter 4 talks about that there is first a blade, then the ear, and then the full corn in the ear. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, there is the good, the acceptable, and the perfect will of God. It takes time. God can't take you from where you are to where you're supposed to be all in one step. That's like going from zero miles an hour to a thousand miles an hour all at once. That's not acceleration. That's a wreck. If you go from zero to 1,000 in one second, you're dead. You have to speed up and it takes time. There are steps and stages. You know, the Lord, I got born again when I was eight years old. That was in 1958. I got baptized in the Holy Spirit when I was in 1968. That was 10 years later. I started seeking the Lord. And of course, God spoke to me and God was doing things. But you know what? They're just steps and stages. It was in 1972 when I finally made a decision to go into full-time ministry. And then Jamie and I started pastoring churches for six years. And then God told us to leave that and go on television and do things. And after, it was in 1999, 31 years after I encountered the Lord, and I had been ministering, I had traveled the world, we were on over 100 radio stations we were doing some good things. In 1999, March, uh, or, uh, July the 26th, I believe it was, the Lord woke me up. It's a long story, but he spoke to me, and he says, you're just now starting your ministry. 31 years. 31 years. You're just now starting your ministry. He says, if you would have died prior to going on television January the 3rd, 2000, you never would have fulfilled what I called you to do. And I had been in ministry for 31 years. 31 years. You know, that was discouraging in one sense that I'd been at it for 31 years and hadn't fulfilled what God wanted me to do. But on the other hand, it was encouraging because there had been great things happen. And if I was just now starting, I'd learn that God never serves dessert first. And so, man, if it was just starting, I, it was going to be better than it had ever been. So it was encouraging and discouraging at the same time. But 31 years later, I was just beginning to fulfill what God told me to do. Then the Lord spoke to me January the 31st, 2002, and told me I was limiting him by my small thinking, and I had to make another adjustment. And man, when I changed my thinking, I wished I had time to tell you the difference that it's made in my life and in my ministry. It's, it's absolutely miraculous. Those that work for me, could tell you about how we've changed. When David Hardesty came to work for us, it was just two weeks or a week and a half after the Lord told me I'd been limiting him that David told me, he says, God told me to quit my job and come and take you to the next level. And when they came to the uh, ministry, we had like 30 employees. We now have over 200 employees. We were reaching about, I'm not even sure, 6% or less of the United States 
with the Gospel Truth Television, we now have the potential of reaching 100%. We actually reach 2.2 billion people around the world can watch our program. And all of that has happened in eight years because God spoke to me and I was still taking steps and stages. See, you just don't get there instantly. There's an acceleration process. And if you become impatient because you want to see this great result and you can't wait and you just want everything right now, I have seen hundreds and thousands of people give up along the way because it's just taking too long. It's impatient. It's lazy. Amen. If you can't say amen, say oh me. <laughs> I'm telling you that this is a major, major problem. How is it that you maintain your enthusiasm and patience? How is it that you keep on track and that you're able to just keep going day after day and year after year? How is it that you're able to do that? It's through patience. Look in the 12th chapter of the book of Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. This is talking again about the same thing. You've got to run with patience. It's not a 50-yard dash. It's a marathon. You know, in high school, they trained me to run the 440, a quarter mile. And man, I had been used to running the quarter mile. And then they put me on a cross country, which was, I think, 3.2 miles. And I had never trained for it. I'd been training for the 440. But they just put me into this new race. And man, when they sounded the gun, I'd never run 3.2 miles. I didn't know you had to pace yourself. I took off at the 440 pace. And everybody else was way behind me. And I thought, this is a piece of cake. And man, I was leading the pack. But you know what? Just past the 440, I began to start giving out. And I just barely finished that race. I think I walked part of the way. And everybody else passed me. I was probably last place. I looked good in the first quarter of a mile. But it wasn't a quarter of a mile run. It was a, it was a marathon. It was a, a, what do they call it, cross country. And you know what? I didn't know how to pace myself. And there are some people that, man, you can get all fired up and you pray and you believe God. And if it comes in the next two minutes, you're great. But you don't know how to last. You know why? It says that we have to run with patience the race that is before us. And then look at the next verse. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. You know where patience comes from. It's a fruit of the Spirit. It comes through the Word. Jesus is the Word. It comes through personal relationship with God. You have to be looking unto Jesus. And again, this amplifies another problem in many, many people's lives, and that is that they honestly don't have a vibrant, life-giving relationship with Jesus. They know Him from a distance. They've trusted Him as their Savior. But to have a good relationship where they not only talk to God, but God talks to them. There's not a lot of Christians that do that. They know the Lord from a distance. But you have to look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. You know, the great example of this is when Peter walked on the water in the 14th chapter of the book of Matthew. They were drowning, and the Lord uh, came walking unto them, and Peter said, Lord, if that's you, bid me come unto you on the water. And he said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and started walking. The only person in the Bible outside of Jesus that walked on the water. It was miraculous. It was major, big thing. He walked on the water. But then he took his eyes off of Jesus, and he saw the wind and the waves boisterous. Think about this. What did the wind and the waves have to do with him walking on the water? nothing. He couldn't have walked on the water if it had been a perfectly calm day. If there had been no waves and if there had been no wind, he still couldn't have walked on the water. It didn't have anything to do with him walking on the water. But what it was, he took his attention off of Jesus, the author and the finisher of his faith, and he began to look at his circumstances and he began to sink. Boy, there's, I've got an entire message on how to become a water walker. You ought to get that because I've, I taught about four hours, four and a half hours on just what I'm saying right here. It's powerful. But he didn't sink all at once. He just began to sink. 
You don't lose your faith all at once. You don't get impatient all at once. It's something that comes gradually. And it's so gradual that many of us don't even realize that we are taking our attention off of Jesus and looking at other things. He began to sink, and it said he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord reached out his hand and lifted him up and said, Peter, why did you doubt? Now notice, it didn't say that the Lord ran over and got him and lifted him up. It said he just reached out his hand. You know what I believe this means? Peter kept his eyes on Jesus when he was out there in the middle of the water a long ways off from Jesus. And I mean, it was an impossible situation. He had to be focused on Jesus and on what Jesus said. And as long as it was impossible and, and he was in a dangerous situation, he looked at Jesus. But after he had covered the majority of the distance, he was so close to Jesus that he could reach out and grab him. He thought he had made it. He relaxed. He took his attention off of Jesus. He got lazy. And he quit looking at Jesus. He looked at the wind and the waves and he began to sink. And when he cried out, Jesus didn't have to run to him. He was right there. He just reached out his hand and picked him up. Did you know that you actually are your weakest, your most susceptible to failure when things are going well for you? When a person's back is against the wall and it's either God's got to come through with a miracle or I'm going to die. When you're facing eviction, when your doctor told you that you're going to die, when your marriage is about to fail, when nothing is working in your life, that's the easiest time to seek the Lord. Because you know what? You know that you have to have a miracle. And boy, you turn off the television set, you'll fast, you'll pray, you'll go to church because your life is in a desperate situation and you need a miracle from God. But you know what has hurt more people than hardship is success. Success will kill your relationship with God quicker than hardship. You can go back through church history and see this. Every time the church is persecuted, it grows. But luxury, which America is in the midst of luxury, some of you may think, oh no, we're in a recession. <laughs> your recession, your poverty level is better than the rich level in most countries. It's a relative thing, and I tell you what, we are living in prosperity, and most of us have been lulled to sleep because of it. We've taken our eyes off of Jesus. We've indulged ourselves. We aren't seeking God with our whole heart. Luxury, success has killed more people than hardship has ever thought about doing. We take our attention off of Jesus. You seek Jesus when it's impossible, and you have to have a miracle, but then when things go to... Go good, all of a sudden we get our attention off of the Lord, we relax, we kick back and get into trouble. You run with patience the race that is set before you by looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. And it goes on to say, For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your mind. This is where the fainting comes, is in your mind. Satan comes at us with thoughts. It's the way you think. Proverbs 23, 7 says, As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Satan comes at you with thoughts, and we have to guard our thoughts. We have to focus our thoughts and our attention on Jesus. And the sad fact is, most of us have allowed the cares of this life, the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things, Mark chapter 4, I believe it's verse 19, to turn our attention away and steal the Word of God from us. And that's the reason that we don't have patience is because we are looking out here and listening to the world offer everything instant gratification. And man, we aren't listening to the Lord, we aren't looking at the Lord, and there's a lot of people that just aren't able to endure because they aren't looking unto Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 11, it talks about Ab uh, Moses endured as seeing him who was invisible. He was looking at the author and the finisher of his faith. That's how he was able to persevere. You have to have a vibrant relationship with God where your attention is on God and not looking to the right or to the left. When Peter took his eyes off of Jesus, he began to sink. This is why many people are fainting in their minds. is because they haven't been looking at Jesus, the author and the finisher of their faith. And so they faint in their minds. This may not be one of those shouting sermons, but it'll help you. 
if this is the problem, if this is what's calling the problem, then it's a simple matter. Just get to where you are focused on Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. Seek Him with your whole heart. Keep your relationship with God strong, and you know what? You'll last. I've got an entire course that I teach in our Bible school entitled Longevity in Ministry. And you know what it basically boils down to? I've even told my students this. I said, it's just relationship with God. You keep your relationship with God red hot and you'll last. And there may be things you don't understand and mistakes that you're making, but if you're in relationship with the Lord, He'll show you and He'll tell you to turn here and avoid this problem. It all comes down to relationship with God. And many of us just really seek the Lord when we are in trouble. You could say it this way. We seek what God has to offer, but we don't seek God Himself. And so when crisis is on, then we're really seeking God. But when things get good, we take our eyes off of Jesus and we begin to sink. And this is why people don't last is because... They aren't looking, they aren't operating in patience. You have to run with patience, which only comes from Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith, and having a vibrant relationship with him. Turn over to 1 Kings chapter 19. For those of you that were here last night, this is a little continuation of something I said about Elijah. And you know, I'm saying a lot of stuff here, a lot of things. It's taken me years and years and years for me to figure it out. And I'm just saying it to you real quickly. I've got an entire tape series entitled Lessons from Elijah or a CD and DVD set. You need to get that and supplement what I'm saying because I teach about, I'm not sure, it's about five tapes, I think, an hour and something each tape. And so there's a lot of teaching and I'm just going through this real quickly. But last night I talked out of 1 Kings chapter 17 how Elijah heard a word from God and he obeyed it. And he delivered that word to Ahab. And only after he delivered the first word did God give him the second step about how he would protect him. And so he went to this brook and God fed him miraculously through the ravens with bread and flesh every morning and evening. And then in the 17th chapter, he went to Zarephath. He stayed with the woman. God miraculously multiplied her food. He raised the woman's son from the dead. In the 18th chapter, he comes back and he appears unto Ahab and called all of the nation together, all of the prophets of Baal and the prophets of the groves, and he called fire down out of heaven and mocked the messengers of Baal. Mocked them. I mean, it, it's great. I wish I had time to teach on that. If you aren't familiar with this, you need to read 1 Kings chapter 18. He mocked them and he says, maybe Baal is deaf. Maybe you got to yell louder. Maybe he's asleep. Wake him up. Maybe he's on a journey. He let them go for hours and hours and then he called fire down out of heaven and the whole nation turned and said, the Lord, he is the God, the Lord, he is the God. They had a great revival. And then he took 400 prophets of Baal and 450 prophets of the grove, 850 people down to the bottom of the mountain and he killed every one of them. You know, I don't know how many people we have in here, but it's close to about 800 and something people. Imagine this. Imagine this many people just killing them. Praise God, we got a different covenant. That's not the way you deal with the people today. But imagine what that would be like to kill 850 people. And then after that, he told Ahab, he says, you better head for home because I hear the sound of abundance of rain. So Ahab got in his chariot and started for Samaria, which was about 20-something miles away, and he went up to the top of Mount Carmel and began to pray, prayed seven times, and finally a cloud about the size of a man's hand came up, and he says, there's a sound of abundance of rain, and he started running, and before he could get to Samaria, there was a deluge, and the drought was broken, and he outran Ahab's chariot and beat him to Samaria with Ahab having a head start. Elijah was pumped. Man, Elijah's endorphins were flowing. His adrenaline was flowing. And after all of these great victories, look at this in 1 Kings chapter 19. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger and to, uh, unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as one of, the, one of them by tomorrow about this time. 
Now, I don't doubt that Jezebel hated Elijah. But you know what? Jezebel was blowing smoke here. She was threatening something that she couldn't deliver. Even tyrants have to respond to the people. And the entire nation had seen fire fall from heaven. And they had said, the Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. And she was not able to kill Elijah. If she had, she would have sent us a, a soldier with a sword, not a messenger with a note. She wanted him dead, but she couldn't kill him. This was intimidation is all it was. This is the way that the devil is. The devil intimidates us and we defeat ourselves. We run off in unbelief. Sure, she wanted him dead, but she couldn't kill him. She just sent this note and look in verse 3. It says, and when he saw that, saw what? It says, I'm going to make your life like the life of one of them. Again, get this picture of this many people right here being dead, and you killed them all. Just imagine what it would take for a person to go through and kill 850 people. Their bodies would be stacked up. He'd be covered in blood. It was graphic. He had a vivid image of these 850 people that were dead. And it says, when he saw that, when he saw himself like one of them, he saw himself dead. She got inside his head. He saw himself defeated. And when he saw that, did you know, it all depends on what you see on the inside. It depends on how you see yourself. This woman said, I'm going to kill you like one of those prophets. You're going to be like one of those. And he saw it. He saw himself dead. And when he did, this man who had challenged the king, who had challenged the prophets, who had challenged the nation, who had stood up and had done things that nobody else had done, ran from a woman with a note. <laughs> because he saw himself dead. He tucked tail and ran. When he saw that, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die and said, here's what he said, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. Boy, there is a lot in that statement. Think about this. He says, basically he's saying, God, kill me. He was spiritual enough that he wouldn't commit suicide, so he asked God to kill him. <laughs> spiritual suicide. He asked God to kill him, and he said, here's the reason, because God, I am not better than my fathers. Boy, that reveals a lot. You know what this means? He had just thought he was better than his fathers. He had just come to the realization, God, I'm not any better than my fathers. And this illustrates the point that I'm making. You have to look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. You have to keep your attention on him. Elijah had had a string of unbroken successes. He went and talked to the king and it came to pass. God protected him. Ravens fed him. He multiplied the widow's food. He was the first person in the Bible recorded that saw a person raised from the dead in the 17th chapter. He raised a man from the dead when nobody else had ever done it. You know, I know like 50 or 60 people that have been raised from the dead and have raised other people from the dead. It's really a relatively commonplace thing today. That's a whole other thing. Some of you think, well, I hadn't heard about it. That's because you're listening to As the Stomach Turns and... ABC and NBC and stuff like that. That's where the problem, you should be in the Word of God and hanging around God's people. Man, it's a relatively common thing today, but when Elijah had done it, nobody had ever been raised from the dead. This was miraculous. And then he called fire down from heaven, caused a revival, made the kings submit to him, outran a chariot, ended a drought. And you know what happened? He got to thinking, I am somebody special. Nobody's ever called fire down from heaven before. Nobody ever raised somebody from the dead. I'm better than my fathers. He took his attention off of Jesus, off of God, 
and began to start thinking it was his own power, his own might that had done this. And Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18 says, Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. The moment you get to patting yourself on the back, the moment you start reading your own press releases, you are in trouble. The moment you start believing the things that you write about yourself and other people write about you, you're in trouble. And Elijah got to thinking, God, I've done things nobody else has done. And when you take your eyes off of Jesus, did you know what? You're only a man or a woman. It's like flying in an airplane. People say, man, I'm flying 500 miles an hour, 30,000 feet. You are not. That plane is flying 500 miles an hour and 30,000 feet. And it's your relationship inside of that plane that gives you the ability to fly. If you don't believe it, step outside and see what'll happen. It's not you flying. It's not you that's causing people's lives to be changed. It's not you that's doing all of these things. It's God inside of you who's doing it. And if you ever take your attention off of Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith, you are headed for a fall. And Elijah didn't have patience. You know why? Because he got caught up in pride. Because success ruined him. When he was back there in Zarephath, and it was all he had done is prophesy a drought, and now he was hiding for his life. It was in a dangerous situation. And you know what? He sought God every day because it was a life and death thing. He hadn't fulfilled anything yet. But after he had done what God told him to do, after fire fell out of heaven, after a person was raised from the dead, and after all of these things, Elijah got to feeling like, man, I have really done something. And he took his attention. He lost his utter dependency upon God. Man, I wished I had days to make this point. Because this needs to be made. We are so independent. We are so into self. We are so self-sufficient. It's like, oh God, you just get me introduced and I can handle it from here. You get me on the stage and I can take care of it now. Man, we need to get to where we are so God-dependent. Like Moses, God told Moses, I will be with you and I will deliver you. And Moses' response, he came back, Exodus chapter 32, and he says, you're going to be with me. He says, if you aren't with me, I'm not moving. He says, I'm to, I was taking that for granted. I want more than just the promise that you're with me. He says, if you aren't going with me, I'm not moving. Boy, you need to get to that place. God, I'm not going to take a step until I know that you have told me to take this step. You need to be God dependent. And some of us are in trials, in crisis. But then as soon as things start going good, as soon as, you're, as soon as the recession is over, all of a sudden nobody starts seeking God with the same intensity because I, you were only seeking Him to get out of the recession so that you could get your needs met. As soon as you get your car, as soon as you get that house that you've been believing for, as soon as you get over being sick, then we go back to doing our own thing and all of a sudden you begin to sink. You've taken your eyes off of Jesus. You don't operate in patience and you only last for a time and then you faint in your mind because you didn't continue with the same intensity. Somebody dies and all of a sudden you take your attention off of Jesus and what he said and you get to looking at your hurt and pain and thinking about this and you begin to sink. Your business fails and all of a sudden you get to thinking about this and you begin to sink. You're going to have to get to a place where you just are fixed on Jesus and you are not going to look to the right hand nor to the left. You aren't moving from one side to the other. And the only way I know how to do this is to sit there in the Word of God. Jesus said, these are the scriptures that testify of me. Jesus is the Word. Jesus was the Word made flesh. You've got to stay in the Word of God. And if you don't have a crisis, and if it's been 10 years since God gave you a major direction, you just stay in the Word of God and keep your attention. You're waiting on Him like a waiter who looks at somebody, and maybe it's been five minutes since they've asked for anything, but the moment they want something, you're right there because you were waiting, you were looking, you were paying attention. God doesn't speak to you every day. He, he does in the sense that he says, I love you, and he gives you guidance. But I mean, it's not going to be one of these major directives. It's not going to be a life-changing word every single minute of every single day. There's going to be times that you sit there and go long periods of time just by faith, 
studying the Word and doing what He told you to do last and just keep doing it until He tells you to do something different. I'm amazed at how many people God told them to do something. There's people that God has told them to come to our Bible school. And he told them to come. And then after a short period of time and something happens and they don't get the job or this happens or that happens and all of a sudden they say, I think God's telling me to leave. And I said, I think God knew it was a two-year Bible school when he sent you here, amen. <laughs> but no, God led me here and then now it's God leading me away. There's people that go to church and they say, God led me to this church and in a few months, God's leading me out of this church. You know what? If God told you to do something, just keep doing it until he tells you to do something different. If God led you to that church, don't leave because you don't like something. God knew what that church was like when he led you there. Amen. Just keep doing what God told you to do. Elijah got caught up into pride, thinking, God, look what I've done. Took his eyes off of God, looked at himself, took credit for it, and he began to sink. And you know what? God tried to raise him up the way that he did Peter. He called him to Mount, um, to Mount Sinai, and he had him come out and stand in the opening of the cave. And there were these three dramatic manifestations, a wind that was so strong it broke the rocks, an earthquake that rent the rocks, a fire that was so strong it melted the rocks. It was dramatic, and God wasn't in any of the dramatics. And finally, he heard a little tiny still voice and it overwhelmed him so much he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and fell before the Lord. And God spoke to him in a little tiny voice. You know, some people are looking for God in the miraculous, in the spectacular, and you just need to get to where you listen to that still small voice that's on the inside. And God spoke to him. And look at this in chapter 19. And in, um, well, you know, I'm going to have to look up these verses. In verse 9, it says, He came hither to a cave and lodged there, and behold, the wind, the word of the Lord came unto him, and he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? You know, if you remember the teaching I gave last night, God sent the provision not to where Elijah was, but to Elijah where Elijah was supposed to be, there. And the problem is that most people aren't all there. We're too much here. And so I talked about that last night. Well, Elijah was supposed to be there in Samaria where there was a great revival. The entire nation had turned to God. They were looking for a leader. And their leader had run hundreds of miles away and was hiding from a woman with a note. And, and God says, what are you doing here? Elijah, you're supposed to be there. What are you doing here? And look at Elijah's answer. He says, Behold, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant and thrown down thine altars and also thy pro and killed, slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it. That was a lie. And Elijah knew it was a lie. If you turn over to the 18th chapter... It says in verse um, 13, this is Obadiah speaking unto Elijah, and he says, Was it not told my Lord what I did when Jezebel slew the prophets of the Lord, how I hid a hundred men of the Lord's prophets by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water? This is just a very short period of time before. A man said, Didn't you hear that I have saved a hundred of the Lord's prophets and I've kept them alive? for these three and a half years feeding them bread and water. He told this to Elijah. And here's Elijah saying, I'm the only one. It was a lie. He knew it was a lie. But you know what? It's exactly what many of you do. Many of you know that things aren't as bad as they are, but you go to feeling bad. Somebody said something about you, and before long, it's like that song you know, that when we were little kids, we used to sing, Nobody loves me. Everybody hates me. I'm going to eat a worm. <laughs> Big ones, fat ones, little bitty, skinny ones, itsy bitsy, fuzzy wuzzy worms. Anybody ever sing that? <laughs> There's some people raising their hand. But you know what? When you get hurt, you know that not everybody hates you. At least your dog likes you or somebody. But, you know, you, it doesn't matter. It's just 
Nobody loves me. Everything's going wrong in my life. It's not the truth, and you know it's not the truth, but that's what you feel like, and so you start saying it, and you start feeling sorry for yourself, and you get into depression. You say, nothing ever works for me. That's not true. Again, I say, we are the most blessed people that have ever lived on the face of the earth. Kings in the past didn't have the conveniences and the luxuries that you've got. Like Pastor Derry and Karen were saying, man, we've all got flush toilets. There's people that live their entire life and never saw a flush toilet. You're blessed. You got microwaves. You've got conveniences. You got cell phones. People are talking about, I'm so poor, and you got one of these $300 cell phones. But we just sit and well, I'm poor. I don't have anything. You know it's not true, but we go ahead and just indulge our emotions. I tell you what, when you do that, you've got this Elijah syndrome, and it's wrong. You're headed for trouble. You need to get grip on reality and thank God that things are as good as they are. Praise God, it could be a lot worse. If you're complaining about your feet hurting, go look at somebody who doesn't have any feet and just thank God that, praise God, your feet are hurting. <laughs> Amen. You need to put things into perspective, but see, Elijah was way out of perspective. And that's what happens when you get into pride, when you get into self, and when you inflate yourself, boy, you go way up here, and then when that bubble bursts, you go just as low the other direction, and that's the reason most people's life is like a yo-yo because it's based on you. You're inconsistent. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's consistent. If your life is based on Jesus, you'll be happy when things look bad and you'll be blessed when things look good. It, you just are the same. But most of us are into ourselves. That's the reason we go up and down. Elijah was saying, I'm the only one. And you know what? This is when God had the wind and the fire come and the earthquake. And then... He asked him this same question again. And in verse 13, it says, It was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? That's the exact same question. Let me tell you, if God asks you a question and you answer it, and then he asks you the same question again, it's because you didn't answer it right the first time. <laughs> Don't give the same answer. It's like he's giving you an ability to take this test over again. You flunked it the first time. This is a do-over. Don't put the same answer down. That's just simple. Amen? But Elijah answered him just exactly the same. Where is that? In verse, um, verse 14, and he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, slain thy prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Again, a lie, and he knew it was a lie. He may have felt it. Some people think, well, I know it's not true, but I feel it so strong. It's true to me. Just pull your thumb out of your mouth and grow up. Amen. I don't care how strongly you feel something. If it's wrong, it's wrong. Amen. Well, I don't feel like God loves me. I know that the Bible says he does, but I don't feel it. Pull your thumb out of your mouth and say, I don't care what I feel like. I'm basing my life on the fact that God loves me. People will say things like, well, God doesn't feel like he's within 100 miles of this place. He said he'd never leave you nor forsake you. He said where two or three are gathered together in his name, there he is in the midst. I don't care what you feel like, God's here. If you don't feel him, it's your feeler that's got the problems, not God. You need to base your life on what God's word says and not go by how you feel. But Elijah felt like he was the only one, and so it was real to him. You know how God responded? He let him take the test over. He gave him a retake. There was mercy but when he missed it, look at what God said unto him. In verse 15, the Lord said unto him, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when thou comest, anoint Haziel to be king over Syria. And anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Sapat, of Abel Mihola, or however you say that name, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. He gave him three things to do. He was speaking to him in an audible voice. 
He says, go anoint Haziel to be king over Syria. Go anoint Jehu to be king over Israel. And go anoint Elisha to replace you. You know what he did? He anointed Elisha to replace him. And he didn't do the other two things. Two out of three things, 66.6% of the things that he was told to do in an audible voice from God, Elisha didn't do it. And you can prove he didn't do it because in 2 Kings chapter 8 and chapter 9, his successor, Elisha, anointed Haziel to be king over Syria and anointed Jehu to be king over Israel. He wouldn't have done it if Elijah had done it. Elijah just checked out. He was depressed and discouraged, and he didn't fulfill God's will for his life. A man who saw the first person raised from the dead, a man who saw food miraculously provided and multiplied, a man who called fire down out of heaven and consumed a sacrifice, a man who turned an entire nation to God, got caught up into himself, and because of it didn't fulfill God's purpose. For his life. Two out of three things God told him to do, he failed to do. And I can spend a lot more time on it again. Get that uh, teaching set on Elijah and it'll give you more detail. But you know what this did? It cost Naboth his life. Those of you that are familiar with the scripture, Ahab, who was the king who was supposed to be replaced by Jehu, Ahab went down and killed Naboth and stole his vineyard from him, a godly man. Naboth died because Elijah didn't fulfill what God told him to do. And then there was a drought and a, because, caused by the Syrians surrounding them. And the people got to eating their own dung. And they, got, they actually killed their own children and cannibalized their children because the drought was so bad. Because Elijah didn't anoint Haziel to replace Benadad. Benadad is the king who did that, the one who shouldn't have been there if Elijah would have done what God told him to do. People died. There was tr terrible drought and severe things that happened because Elijah didn't obey God. Elijah didn't fulfill everything that God told him to do because he got caught up in pride. He took his attention off of Jesus, the author and the finisher of his faith. He quit operating in patience. You know, anybody can start, but it's how you finish that counts. Elijah missed it big time. And yet, you know, some people would think that God just rejected him. No, God still loved him. And you can read, this is one of the amazing things in Scripture. In 2 Kings chapter 2, Elijah, this man who failed to do two-thirds of what God commanded him in an audible voice, and because of it, many people died. This same man in 2 Kings chapter 2, walked with God so much that God came and took him up in a whirlwind to heaven and he never died. He got translated up into heaven and a chariot came and separated it between him and Elijah and he was caught up into heaven. A man who failed. A man who wasn't everything that God wanted him to be. You know, God's grace will still be there for you. God still loves you. It's not about you. You can still go to heaven without following God and doing everything He wants you to do, but we've got a purpose. We've got a job to do. Who knows what things would have been like if Elijah would have obeyed God and have not got into this self-pity? Who knows what miracles could have come through him? We don't know. It's hard to tell what might have happened. It's hard to tell... You know, we have now had 50 million plus babies aborted in the United States that, that have been counted. New York and California aren't forced to count their abortions. And so those are the ones we've counted. Who knows how many children have been aborted? Who knows what they could have done? Who knows what God's plans for them? Who knows what kind of politicians we would have had that have been murdered? Musicians we've had, scientists, lawyers, doctors. Who knows what we've missed? It's hard to tell. We're going to have to wait until we get on the other side before we understand fully what happened. But, you know, here's another thing to consider. Who knows what would have happened if ministers would have fulfilled their course and instead of 80% quitting within five years, 
and then 80% of the ones who are still there after five years being depressed and discouraged, what would happen if they knew how to operate in patience and look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of their faith? And if every person who started the race was still in the race and still doing what God told them to do, who knows what that would have done? Who knows what our situation would have been like? Who knows how many John Wesleys and George Whitfields and Billy Grahams we would have had if people just were able to follow through. There's a lot of people that start, but there's not a lot of people that finish. I'm telling you, finishing is more important than starting. And you've got to learn how to fulfill God's will and patience. These, all of these verses that I've brought out today, it's through faith and patience that you inherit the promises. You have to look unto, you have to run with patience the race that is set before you, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. You've got to start walking and not take your attention off to the right hand or to the left. You can't look at the wind and the waves and get into the grandstands arguing with the spectators. Stay on track. Do what God told you to do. Stay single-minded. Focus on Jesus. Have a relationship with Jesus that it doesn't matter if things are good or bad. You're still going to be focused on Jesus. Don't just seek him when it's hard. Seek him all of the time. Get to a place that you aren't just seeking God until you get relief and then you'll go back to doing things your own way that got you into trouble in the first place. Just keep seeking Jesus. Make a commitment that you're going to love him with all of your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength and that you don't ever deviate from it and you stay focused on God. I know what I'm saying is just, it, it is so different than most people. Most people go in spurts. You aren't going to win the race in spurts. It's going to have to be consistent. You're going to have to get to where you start and don't stop. Where you make a decision, I don't care what happens. If I pray for somebody and they fall over dead, I'm going to step over them and say, next. You just, you make a decision that, praise God, I'm going to keep going. I am not going to change. And it takes some effort. This isn't for lazy Christians. You're going to have to seek God with your whole heart. But it's worth it, brothers and sisters. I haven't finished my course yet, but I've been at it for 42 years. 42 years, and I can truthfully tell you that I am more excited and just as committed to God as I was 42 years ago when God touched my life. The things that God has done in my life have not waned. They haven't faded away. I don't have to get refilled and ask God to return me back to my first love, and, oh, God, I've lost it. Would you light the fire again? You know, I was singing a song. I was playing this CD by Keith Green, and I love some of Keith Green's stuff, but I was playing one of his songs, and he was singing, oh, God, please light the fire. And I'm not condemning him. I understand that that happens to people. But I just thought, thank you, Jesus, that my fires never burn out. Thank you, Jesus, that my fire hasn't burned out, that it's, it's burning brighter today than it's ever burned. And some people think, I don't believe you can live that way. Well, then it won't work for you. <laughs> but you know what? When you come back tonight, I'm going to share with you how you can keep the things of God active and current in your life and stirred up and how you can keep your focus on the things of God. You do not have to be like a yo-yo up and down. And just sometimes hot for God and other times cold. Sometimes you're walking with God, sometimes you aren't. That's not God that determines that. That's not the way that it has to be. There are reasons that it's like that. And if you can understand why that happens, then you can solve this situation and you can keep your mind and your heart focused on God. You've got to finish the course. Paul said, I have finished the race. There's a lot of you that the way you're running... You aren't going to finish. It doesn't happen accidentally. It has to be on purpose. You've got to force yourself. Focus on it. And unless you put some effort into it, it's not going to happen.